Hey guys, what's going on? Welcome back to the next episode of Catching 101 TV. Super excited for uh, today's guest. Um, if you're familiar with my channel or you're following me, you probably know who he is already. Uh, he's spoken to Ketricon. You've probably seen him on uh, Twitter. He's rising very quickly through the ranks uh, of baseball a couple years ago. He was a college baseball coach. Uh, then he started working with the Phillies, and now he's in the big leagues with the Cubs. Again, I'm sure you're all very familiar with him. And Craig, I'm also wearing my Cub shirt today to support you guys. Uh, but we got Craig Driver on the call today. Mm -hmm. Hey, guys. How you doing? Craig, man, thanks for coming on. I uh, Like I said, that, that was the brief intro, and, and I do want to get into the catching stuff uh, fairly quickly, but let's say there's by chance somebody listening who doesn't know who you are or where to find you. I'd love for you just to kind of briefly maybe run through your background and, and kind of share that with people because uh, you're one of the guys who has had one of the uh, I get, I'd call it a success story. You know, you've, you've very quickly risen uh, and done a lot of impressive things over a short period of time. So I'm sure people would like to know kind of uh, the, the backstory and, and where it all began. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll give you kind of a, a little bit longer version than I would normally give because I think that my experiences with Ketricon were are a big part of the reason that I am where I am. Um, but I, I was born and raised in Seattle, Washington. Um, I went to a small college called the University of Puget Sound um, and played there. Was fortunate enough to have my college coach offer me a job right after I finished playing. So, uh, you know, he kind of took a chance on myself and um, another guy in professional baseball now that actually played with me, Kainoa Correa. Um, we were the two assistants for this small Division three college in the Northwest that had, had no experience whatsoever and um, were making very, very little money. Um, but we got an opportunity to get our foot in the door and, um, it, it worked really well for us. Um, Kai stayed for a few years there. I actually went off and got my master's at Central Washington University, um, a place where my, my dad went to school and played baseball. And, um, you know, I've had some long ties with their coaching staff and their head coach, Desi Story. Um, and so a couple years at a division two, um, as a graduate assistant. And then I actually went back to the University of Puget Sound and coached there for, for two more years. Um, as the recruiting coordinator and worked for the guy that was actually the outfield coach when I played, um, he became the head coach, Jeff Halstead. Um, so he gave me some great opportunities there to get my feet wet in terms of recruiting um, and, and a lot of game management stuff that I hadn't had an opportunity to do as a, as a grad assistant in terms of, you know, coaching third base, running the offense. Um, I, I kind of had my, my hands on a few more things than I had in the past, which was definitely helpful for me. Um, Following that, um, I got an opportunity to coach at Yale University, um, which I think everyone knows of academically, but they probably don't know a ton about the baseball side of things. Um, that was a really fortunate bounce for me. Um, another catcher con speaker, Tanner Swanson, um, who's a good buddy of mine from the Northwest, um, recommended me to um, a guy named Tucker Frawley, who's now the, um, I think he's the assistant director of player development for the Minnesota Twins. I think that's his title. I can't remember. It's something, something weird. Um, but uh, Tuck was kind of looking for guys on Twitter, more or less, and he stumbled upon Tanner. And um, Tanner and I had worked together at a few of his camps at the University of Washington. And, um, and I ended up making that move across the country. I was, you know, 26 years old. So it was a good time for me to, um, you know, make a move like that. Um, we had a ton of success at Yale. We had the, I think we had the, the most wins in Yale history, um, which was, you know, in no part other than, you know, we had a really good group of players. Um, I think we ended up having like seven drafted guys on that 28 man roster, which for an Ivy league school is um, a pretty good haul. Um, so, you know, I think when you, when you put together those, that quality of players with um, some coaches that are willing to think outside the box and do some things that are, maybe a little bit non-traditional and you know just really roll their sleeves up and get to work that that worked out really well um in that time i was at yale i, I got a chance to speak at ketricon for the first time um i did a presentation on blocking for zan and you know i i, I was going into it i was kind of hesitant on like i was like i don't know if this is necessarily my best skill <laughs> um this isn't the thing that i maybe do the best um but that was kind of what, what you'd asked me to do. And um, so I, I jumped in and did it. And um, kind of unbeknownst to me, Brian Sienko, who's the catching coordinator for the Dodgers, had been talking to um, Gabe Kapler, who's now the manager of the San Francisco Giants and was my manager in, with the Phillies, um, about me potentially filling this role as a bullpen catcher and catching coach and more specifically focusing on receiving um, as that was an area of the game, especially, you know, in 2018, when I got hired, that we were really trying to leverage um, 
to create some more wins. And the Phillies had some catchers that needed some work in that regard. So um, it was something that was really important for them and kind of on the forefront of their hiring process at that time. Um, so I spoke, um, apparently I did a good job. I don't know. Um, and Ryan was impressed and, um, he told cap about me while I was speaking, I got off the stage and, um, I had a, had a text from cap at the time. Um, and we kind of went back and forth, ended up getting the job, um, coaching there for, for two years. Um, and speaking of Ketricon another time, I did a presentation on receiving, which is probably a little bit more in my wheelhouse. Um, one that I really liked, it was a, it was a case study of, of great receivers in major league baseball. So rather than just, you know, taking a, a shot at what things I think were important, I was trying to look at what makes the guys that are really good metrically really good. Um, so I, I, I really liked that presentation just as a way to look at, you know, this is how we acquire the skills as professional coaches. We figure out what guys have success and then we kind of work backwards from there. Um, and then following this last season, I actually re-upped my contract in Philadelphia um, for another two years. But um, in November, I was offered an opportunity to go to the Chicago Cubs as the first base coach and catching coach and work for David Ross. And, um, you know, we, we have a really fortunate situation where we have a ton of catching guys and Rossi and Mike Napoli and Mike Borzello um, that all have a ton of experience working with catchers. So it's a it's a really good environment. And, you know, I, I think we have two of the the more skilled catchers when you talk about all around packages and Wilson Contreras and Victor Caratini to work with there. So um, really, uh, really excited about that opportunity. If we ever play any baseball this year and uh, uh, looking forward to going through that, but um, that's my kind of my long introduction, but I thought it was important to share because of my, my ties to Petrocon for sure. Well, I definitely appreciate it. And like I said, you got a lot of interesting things going on and, and I'll be honest, I, like I said, I am a Cubs fan. I like, I like Carantini and I like Contreras. So I'm excited to watch what you guys do. And it's cool being on a staff with so many other catching guys. Uh, I would imagine you always have, you know, somebody to bounce an idea off of, um, you know, a different perspective, a lot, of, a lot of sets of eyes on a couple of really important guys. So, uh, really cool. Now, like I said, I do want to get into a lot of catching stuff, you know, specifically that's what we're on here for. Um, but I'd like to ask one question kind of before we get started, uh, because a few people have asked me about it. Um, like I mentioned earlier, you know, I think a lot of people you know, in the catching world, but in the baseball world in general, would really consider what you've done, you know, a, a huge success story. You know, you went from being a college coach to taking a bullpen catcher job to now you're, you're on the field in the big leagues coaching. You've done it over a relatively short period of time. Um, I know that there's a lot of uh, a lot of catching coaches, but I'd say a lot of specifically young catching coaches who may aspire to do what you've done or maybe want to follow in your footsteps or, you know, they look up to you. What advice would you give guys like that, um, you know, who maybe aspire to, to coach at the next level or just kind of take a similar route to what, you, what you've done? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's it's a lot of what you, what you tend to hear from a lot of people. I mean, and it's, it's one of those things that's really frustrating as a young coach, I think, to hear like, you know, make sure that you're making connections and, um, you know, networking with other coaches in the industry. But, you know, at the end of the day, like that part of the, of my story is, is ultimately what allowed me to make all of the jumps that I made. Like I, I got hired by my first job by my college coach. I went to be a grad assistant for a coach that I've known for almost my entire life um, due to my dad's ties to that program. I went back to my alma mater and coached there with a, a coach that I played for in college. Um, you know, I got hired at Yale through my connections with Andrew Swanson. I got my job with the Phillies through my connections with um, Ryan Sienko. Um, and then I actually got a big part of the reason I got my job with the Cubs was because our, our bullpen coach in Chicago, Chris Young, was our pitching coach in Philadelphia. And then also there's um, Theo Epstein and Craig Greslow, who are both Yale alums um, that work in our front office. So um, you start to see all of those different pieces start tying me to all these different jobs just based on connections that I've made. So I think that part's really important. And then I, I think the other thing that's really valuable is just to, to be really – invested in where you're at at the time that you're there. Um, you know, I think that's the thing that people always asked me when I was coaching in college, whether it was at a division three, division two, II, division one school, um, you know, do you ever want to work in professional baseball? And I would say no. <laughs> and it wasn't because I didn't want to, it was because I never thought it would be an opportunity for me um, just because of my lack of professional playing experience. So, um, you know, that really allowed me to, to be really invested in the program that I was in. And I think that's something that's really, really important for, for coaches that are, are, are looking to make jumps is that, 
they really, rather than investing their time into figuring out how they make the next move, just really invest in the place that you're at and, and do that. And, and then I think finally, it's just really come up with a lot of ways to challenge your thought process, challenge what you're doing, think about doing things differently um, than other people are doing them. Because I think that's one of the things that, that I've had some success with is um, I've really kind of challenged how I was taught to catch. And, and I think what we've seen with this position more than probably any other position in baseball is that it's changing rapidly. And I think it's going to continue to do that as we probably transition towards an automated strike zone at some point in the next, you know, how many years. Um, but those people that can really tie themselves into like being able to adapt quickly and adapt on the fly have a lot of success um, jumping levels, I think, is what people are finding. So um, as I was looking at, you know, different ways to do things, people are going like, hey, maybe this guy can figure out receiving because he's figured out some other stuff that's a little bit different. Um, but I think the other thing is I was really fortunate to be with some people that really pushed me um, intellectually and just kind of got me to think outside the box a little bit more than I maybe traditionally would have. Um, but it really allowed me to kind of organize my thoughts and get to a place where, you know, I had a plan for what I wanted to do with our guys. And then I also wasn't too, you know, hard headed to say like, Hey, this is the plan and it's not going to change. You know, I, I could always say like, Hey, this is how I want to develop our catchers. But if I find something better, we can divert this course a little bit to get you where you need to get. So I think those three things are, are really valuable. The, the networking side of things, um, just the the ability to kind of be where your feet are for for lack of a better phrase i think it's one that's commonly used and then also want to just kind of push yourself um in terms of how you think about the position that you coach and what you do that those kind of things those are the really valuable parts for me I man i think that's excellent advice i mean it's good advice for any coach you know it, it's hard to disagree with that and i kind of thought you were going to go a couple of those directions but i just wanted to hear it out of your mouth uh first yeah so i, I i'm interested too you know as a guy who is a college coach and like i said i listened to you speak at catcher con i knew you were I knew you were an intelligent guy and a hardworking guy and prepared just from just from getting to know you. Um, but when you made the jump from college, you know, straight to the big leagues, what, what was that experience like? I mean, I, I know you're probably you're, you're almost flooded with data. Uh, you, you know, I, I would just love to know what was that experience like going from college, you know, straight to professional baseball and, and the big leagues specifically? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's two parts to it. I, I th you hit on part of it is like the amount of information that you have available to you is just, inc especially at that time, like uh, things like Baseball Savant was kind of like just getting off the ground in terms of access to video and stuff like that. Um, so it, it wasn't as developed as it is now. So, I mean, I remember sitting in my office at Yale for, for hours trying to find the right clips of professional catchers doing stuff the way that we're asking them to do them so we can show our guys. Um, just kind of mining through these YouTube videos and like, all right, if I want to find guys receiving, I have to look at not Austin Barnes receiving because I'm never going to find a video of that. I'm looking at Clayton Kershaw strikeout videos because I know I'm going to find some strikeouts looking in there that are going to have good receiving in there. Um, so I think that was the first thing that was really different is I all of a sudden I had just a ton of information for me. So just feeding my curiosity, that was that was outstanding for me to be able to just jump on our internal system, jump on true media, look at this video, see how the metrics stack up and really do a lot of homework on why guys are good. And I think, you know, that kind of ties back into that, that case study um, catcher con talk that I did was, you know, that's, that's how we ultimately came up with this information is that we, we did case studies of the guys that are really good. And that was kind of when that process all began is when I got hired by the Phillies because all of a sudden that act that video and those metrics were accessible for me when they hadn't been before. Um, but in terms of working with the players, um, that was a totally different process. Uh, you know, as much as I wanted to dive in with the metrics and the video and get my hands dirty as quickly as possible with that, with the players, I took a much slower approach. I wanted to, to listen a lot more and talk a lot less, um, not go in and say like, Hey, I know all of you guys have been playing professional baseball and some of you have been playing in the big leagues, but we're going to do things differently this year. Um, you know, we kind of went into this and said, you know, hey, this is what we're trying to achieve. Let's talk about some ways that we can get there. And so for us, it was more of like, let's make the environment as close to game like as possible. And let's see if you can replicate some moves that other guys are making rather than this is what you should do right now. Um, and I think I think guys responded really well to that. Um, you know, we did a lot of 
perceived velocity training where, you know, we're just trying to speed them up to see if they can make the moves they actually want to make. Um, Cause I think so often we get into the game and then the stuff that we do in, in the cage off the machine completely changes. And that's what we were, um, we're trying to combat because I think myself and Dusty Wathen, our third base coach and Bob Stumpel, our other bullpen catcher who all worked with our catchers together, they knew that, you know, my voice wasn't going to be heard as well by these big league catchers without them knowing me. So it kind of gave them an opportunity to get to know me a little bit better um, before we dove into like really minute mechanical adjustments that we were trying, we were going to make with guys. Um, And that's kind of part of the process. Like so many people think about professional baseball and spring training. They say like, Hey, if you can't get it done in spring training, you missed your opportunity. Um, But what I really found to be the case is that, your best opportunity to make changes in guys was during spring training, but you can make those small adjustments that go incrementally throughout the season. If you just put that time in to just be able to constantly have that conversation and have guys not tune you out because, you know, they're going like, I got to play tonight. You know, it's, it's, Hey, this is always a conversation. This is always something that we're constantly working on, constantly trying to make small adjustments to um, and going from there. But yeah. And I, I think that the, short answer to that is just listen a lot was was my strategy um let them tell me what they were seeing what they were thinking what they were seeing what they were feeling um and then go through and be able to adjust from there man really good advice again i get like everything you say it's it hits the nail on the head i think uh you got to listen a lot more and, and speak a lot less especially when you're in an environment like that so uh interesting to hear you yeah. say that i, I know it'd be easy for a lot of guys to feel like you're on top of the world. Oh man, I just got a, a job in bro ball in the big leagues. And, uh, but, but as soon as you get there, you're like, Holy cow, now, now I'm in a different level. And these guys, I got, I got to earn their respect and earn their trust. Um, so I think you took the, the, the right approach there. Um, you, you, you've mentioned it a couple of times and I would agree with you now, uh, not to knock any other areas, but I think you're becoming most well known for what you do kind of in the receiving world and, and receiving, um, so again, I obviously think you're, you're more than capable coach of a blocking and throwing and all the other skills, but, but receiving is where I kind of want to spend a fair amount of time, uh, just because you have made such a name for yourself. And I think you've got interesting ideas when it comes to it. So if you had to give me the elevator pitch, just a short version, what, what does Craig Driver believe when it comes to, what is your receiving philosophy? What do you get, what do you want to come across to the guys? Yeah. I mean, I, I think for me, I think about this in three parts. So number one. And for me, I, the more that I've done this with, you know, the, the video and the data to back it up on a daily basis, I think if you can't do this, you're, you don't go to two and three. Uh, but number one is keep your glove below the ball as the pitch comes towards the catcher. Um, so often what you see is the ball going down as it goes towards the catcher and the catcher's glove going up above it and then coming back down to catch it. And I think even more so we're seeing that now with, you know, the, the, the kind of current trend of guys taking their glove to the ground. So the really good guys take their glove to the ground and they work up fluidly through the ball. The guys that are just trying to figure out how to do that, take their glove down to the ground. And as the pitch gets thrown, they bring it back up to where they start and then they work back down to the ball. Um, and they have a lot of trouble with that. So you end up creating a ton of movement, um, but none of it's really getting you anywhere. Um, so I, I think that's, that's the first thing for me. If you can't keep your glove below the ball, um, assuming we're talking about low pitches, obviously, um, then that's the first place you need to be able to go is can somehow find a way to control your glove load enough so that you can work under the baseball as the ball comes towards home plate. Because almost every pitch, I mean, realistically, every pitch does go down. But if you think about like high spinning, forcing fastballs at the top of the zone, for the most part, they're going to stay relatively level. They feel like they're kind of going up at you as a catcher. But everything else is moving downward. So we want to be able to make sure that we can stay down and work up through the ball. Um, Number two is that you can work the ball back towards your frame. Um, So I think people think so often about the strike zone as this box and they move the ball back into the box. Um, And I want our guys to think more about moving the ball back to their body, back to their strength um, as they go through their training process. So I would say probably 75% of the time, and especially early in spring training and when we're trying to acquire skills, we don't use a plate at all. We'll we'll often use a line, like a, you know, like I think some of our turf in our cage is like a, either it was a third baseline or it it was a football line or whatever it may be, but we'll shoot the ball right down the line 
So we really want our guys to think about the ball moving back to their strength, coming back to their body rather than moving it back to the zone. Because you find so many guys that like, and realistically they do this in the game, right? Is they set up on the outside corner, their left shoulder is lined up with the corner of the plate and they move the ball this way. So they're actually moving the ball away from the strength in their body. So we're trying to teach them like, hey, this is for the most part where I'm going to move the ball. And then once they figure out how the ball moves back towards their frame, then we start thinking about corners of the plate and, you know, different setups and different situations, you know, backdoor two seams and cutters, um, you know, backdoor sliders for lefty or for right-handed pitcher to left-handed hitter, you know, things of that nature where maybe you do something a little bit differently than you would if you were just set up right down the middle and the ball is thrown anywhere in the strike zone. So I really think a lot about that. I think it's really important. I think it's often overlooked is that we're thinking too much about how to get the ball into the box and not enough about how to use our leverage and keep the ball on our frame. Um, and then finally, the last thing is um, being on time for the pitch. And, you know, I think we so often we've said beat the ball to the spot. And I think what that's created for a lot of catchers is they're almost over anticipating and they're getting out of their leverage a little bit. So I just want to make sure that when the ball hits my glove, it hits my glove because I wanted it to hit my glove, not because it, it blew me up. And not because I got way out extended and the ball finally got to my glove, but I get to pick the timing. I'm always on time with whenever I want to arrive at the baseball. So, I mean, for me, those are the three most important things. If I want to talk about, you know, receiving is being able to keep your glove below the ball, being able to work the ball back to your frame, and then um, being on time at the pitch. I think all those make a lot of sense. Um, you know, and I would say – some of it is a little bit, you know, new. Some of it is newish. I mean, I mean, I think for a long time, you know, well, now you see a lot of guys who are starting either with their mid on the ground or their pre-pitch movement. You know, they're, they're super low. There's a very conscious effort of trying to stay below the ball and work below the ball. Um, now, again, you've been with guys at the big league level and you've, you know, coached college guys. Um, I'm curious at a couple things. Number one, what did guys struggle with, you know, who maybe – who have a hard time picking up that movement or who have a hard time, you know, just like the move you said that they start up here, they start low and they, they you know, there's a lot of movement. Uh, a guy who struggles with that, where would you maybe start with them? I'm not sure if it's a drill or if it's a mindset or if it's just maybe making them conscious or aware of it, but what would, where would you start with somebody who maybe does struggle with that and has a very inefficient glove? Yeah. Um, I, I think for me, it's, it's the reason that they got that people use the ground as the glove load location is because they want to work below the ball. But for me, I try to use the ground as a constraint more than anything else. It's something that the catcher can actively feel and they can touch, right? So if you can, if your glove is touching the ground and then the ball comes in and you pick it up, then you lose contact with the ground. So that's kind of the mindset that I want them to attack, you know, all of those glove on the ground drills, whether or not they're going to catch with their glove on the ground in the game or you know, whether or not they're going to do that. Um, I want them to think about creating connection with the ground as a means to stay underneath the baseball and stay touching the ground, not just to be, you know, going from low to high. Um, so uh, that for me is the, is the first thing. I mean, and I think working back a little bit, like realistically, the reason this is a problem is because it's a, it's a fight or flight reflex, reflex for the most part. Like if somebody goes to punch you in the chest, your hands are like this, right? <laughs> so when someone throws a baseball at you 100 miles an hour, your hands go like this. That's what they want to do. They want to make sure you don't get hit in the sternum, right? But so what we're trying to do is actually fight that reflex and teach them that like, hey, the ball's not going to hit you in the chest. You're going to be able to get to this baseball if you trust your hands and go to the location and just use your eyes. Um, so that's kind of what you're, what you're fighting when you're, and then I think it's also important to know what you're trying to get out of it is, is for me thinking about using the ground as a constraint. So like one of the things that I think is a really good drill, it's some that, you know, we've used with Contreras a little bit this year that um, he likes is he goes to the ground and then I get to put the ball in the machine at whatever time I want. So I can put the ball in the machine as he's going to the ground. I can put the ball in the machine right when he touches. I can put, I can, they can go to the ground and wait. So I get to pick the tempo. So it forces him to really feel the ground and not bounce. So what you see with a lot of guys is they just go to the ground and they tap it and come back up. Right. But if you can go to the ground and stall out and then wait for the ball and see it with your eyes first and go through, 
I think that's really valuable. So I really like that drill. We're just thinking about, you know, having the feeder dictate the timing of the glove being on the ground. Um, and I think that, you know, by doing that, catchers tend to figure out, okay, here's how long I need to wait to be able to get to that baseball. Um, so that's a really good way to do it. Um, and then one, another thing that I've talked about a lot is just using glove slides and different moves with their glove on the ground. Um, whether they're going, you know, to their right and working back through, whether they're starting outside their body and working through the ball, um, whether they're starting in the middle. And I, what I do is I actually have them screw their hand into the ground this way to work up through. Um, I think that's a really valuable one because I think so often guys get their hand on the ground and they want to go this way and it pushes their elbow down, um, which isn't actually the move that we want to create. We want to create that elbow going up and the thumb going down to work up through so you can bring the ball up to the height of the elbow. Um, so, so I like that one. And then and going also going this way to work back through there. So you create some different angles, but by sliding the glove across the ground, it's once again, you get that, that touch sensation with the ground so you can feel where your glove is at rather than, you know, just tapping your glove on the ground where realistically it's coming right back up in the air. So the more that I can get them to feel their space down there, I think the better they tend to be when we're thinking about keeping the glove underneath the baseball. I think that's excellent, man. What I really like about that is you, I like the context that you're adding there because, you know, it's easy for a lot of people to, you know, to get on Twitter or get on Instagram and you watch these videos and you see the big league guys doing this. And it, it's sometimes hard to explain what their motivation is for the movement or what they're trying to achieve with it. All you see to the naked eye is just the glove goes down, the glove comes back up. So I think a lot of guys just try to mimic that maybe without the right intentions behind it. So, so I definitely appreciate you kind of sharing why guys would do that and, and couple, you know, a couple mm -hmm. of drills uh, as well. That's important. Yeah. I, I do want to move on to kind of the, the, the second thing you spoke about is, is, you know, talk about working the ball back to your body. I think that's a good way to put it. Um, I, I like the way you worded that. Uh, I think it was probably last week, not, it, fairly recently, there was a, a video of Salvador Perez going through some receiving stuff. You may have seen it online. Uh, and he was receiving yeah. balls. He, he was, you know, I think it looked like third base line. But he, he had set his body up where the, the foul line had split him and he's receiving balls off the machine. Uh, and I love that. It's just another constraint, another visual, uh, kind of like you're talking about where we're working the ball back to the back to the box or, or back to our frame. You know, again, I think it's, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's confusing to a lot of players. You know, the, the, the strike zone is uh, ambiguous. It changes, you know, where do I work back the ball to? How much is it? Do I move it two inches? Do I move it nine inches? Uh, I think it, when you, when you give guys a frame of reference and Hey, let's move back towards inside our body. I think that makes it a little bit simpler and a little bit easier to understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, it's so like so it's so easy to watch a major league game and say like all right i watch that guy and he moves the ball back into the strike zone you know but when you're you know a 12 year old catcher a 15 year old catcher you don't have a strike zone box in any of your games and you don't have <laughs> most likely you don't have any video either right so you're not you're kind of just guessing as to where to go so you know i really think that like using the logo on their chest protector is a really good place to start um and i think that ultimately that's what tells you how much you move the ball. Like I think this, this conversation with manipulating the baseball is, is a really valuable one because obviously we can. Um, it's something that we're, we're finding more and more in this time is the umpires just don't see as much as um, we've traditionally given them credit for, but you know, guys are going like, well, how much should I move this? And it's, it's kind of a more of a matter of how much can you move this? Um, so the ball comes in and, you know, let's say I have a really bad pre-pitch on this pitch and the ball's going this way, my glove's tracking it this way. If I pull it back to my shoulder, that's a big move, right? If I pull it back just a little bit, that's a more reasonable move because of my attack. Now, if the ball's coming this way and my hand is on this side of it and I'm working back through, I pull it to my shoulder, it doesn't feel as big because the angle is right. So I'm playing on the right plane with the pitch. Right. So the, our hitting coach in Philadelphia, John Maley, who's now the um, one of the hitting coaches for the Angels, he would always tell he would always tell the hitters like this, the, the story of the path of the pitch will tell you the story of your swing path as you go through. And I think this really applies to what the catchers are doing now is that they're trying to anticipate what the pitch is going to do. And it's a lot easier for the catcher because they know what the pitch is um, and then they're going to take their glove path 
to go the opposite direction of the ball movement. So when it's a fastball, it's relatively easy, right? You just want to work it back up because the ball is going straight for the most part. But when you have a slider that's going this way or a two seamer that's going this way or a curveball that's going straight down, it, the pitch gives you a little bit better idea of what you're doing. So, um, you know, one of the things that, that we've talked about with some of our guys is just thinking about your pre-pitch load as a mirror of what the pitch is going to do. So um, it's like a pitch specific pre-pitch load. So, you know, if you're catching a slider, maybe your hand goes this way a little bit more, you know, if you're catching a curveball, maybe it's going down a little bit more. Um, you know, if you're going to catch a high heater, it's probably staying a little bit more neutral. But as you start to understand your pitchers, and especially the guys like, a, you know, a Kyle Hendricks or a Aaron Nola, who we had in Philadelphia, that have a really good idea of where the ball is going to go, you can do a lot with the baseball. You know, the guys like you Darvish or, you know, Vince Velasquez, somebody like that, that, you know, have great stuff and their command maybe wavers a little bit more. It's a little bit harder to anticipate. So you're probably trying to stay a little bit more neutral. But um, I think it's a really valuable thing to really be thinking about what the pitch is going to do and really anticipate that so it allows you to work the ball back to the zone. It allows you to work the ball back to your body. Um, you know, ultimately, the, the move is dictated by how good your attack is. You can move it more when your attack's good. You can move it less when your attack's bad. Um, I, I like how you worded that. I, yeah, I really like the idea of your move mimicking or mirroring the pitch. I think that's, I think that's important. Uh, so the next question I have for you is, uh, it's a tough one. It's a question that probably has no answer, uh, but but I'd like to get your okay. thoughts on it. So I think okay. for the most part, you know, most catchers, we're, we're really trying to exploit the bottom of the zone. You, you don't get me wrong. It's nice mm-hmm. to get the edges east and west, but for the most part, I think, you know, where we're really trying to do a good job is at the bottom of the zone. Um, yeah. Is there, you know, for the guys who are listening, and I know you've reviewed tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of pitches, is that, what would be a reasonable amount or, or a reasonable value where we think we can steal a strike at the bottom of the zone? Is it, is it an inch? Is it two inches? Is it four inches? Is, is, there, uh, is there a number or, or what does that, what does that kind of depend on? Oh man, I don't, I wish I knew the answer to that question. Um, I mean, like the way I think about it is I want our guys to be able to catch anything that bounces to anything that's at the bottom of the zone with the same move. So that's one of the things that I watch a lot is like if a guy throws a slider or especially like a 12, six curveball, it's probably a better example. And if he bounces it right in front of your glove. So, you know, that ball that, that just barely is, is barely in the dirt. Does, does your glove track in the right way? Um, and I think if it does, I think that you probably have, you know, maybe this much below the zone, you know, three to four inches, um, of, of realistic possibility, depending on the umpire, obviously, certain guys are going to have less of a low zone than others. Um, but I think that you can get there um, if, you're, if you're moving the right way. Um, you know, I think one of the best, like the most telltale signs of receivers that are going to struggle is when they throw that curveball, it's going to, that's just going to bounce and their glove comes back up and goes back down. Um, and, and it really feeds into everything that they do, right? Because if you're thinking about blocking that pitch and your glove's going way up here, it's going the wrong direction to block it. Um, so the guys that can keep their glove down and wait and see the pitch longer allow themselves to work back, you know, if it's maybe it's four inches higher than they think it is, it allows them to work that ball right up to the zone, or maybe it's four inches shorter than they think it is and it's really going to be a block. All they have to do is turn their glove over rather than take their glove back to the ground. Um, so kind of like a a, like in a swing you you create a hole if you have a lot of room back here right that's not really my area I was a terrible hitter but um you know in the same thing here if the glove goes down and then it comes back up it creates a hole down in the middle of their body um which is going to hurt them receiving it's going to hurt them blocking and ultimately it's going to hurt them throwing because they're not going to be able to um move the ball back to their transfer location as well as they would if they're more direct with the ball coming to their transfer location so um you know, that, that for me is, is, is a vital portion, but yeah, I would guess that most guys can think about like the, the middle of the shin um, of their shin guard as like a, a reasonable height, but realistically, I want them to have the same action on every pitch that they're going to catch rather than turn over to block, um, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, it does. And, and you kind of, you kind of hit on the next question I was going to ask, you know, so it seems like a lot of this stuff is taught so that we can steal strikes or expand the zone or however you want to word it. Um, and, and I would, ex, I would expect most guys to, you know, use these methods or use the, the glove movements, whatever we're going to call them uh, for balls. They think they can get for a strike, maybe a ball that, like you said, right below the knee, maybe it's two inches, maybe it's four inches. Uh, it can depend, but e even on yeah. what, we, what we would call a clear ball, a ball that we don't expect to get, it's going to be a strike like, you know, 5% of the time at the bottom of the zone, you still want them to catch those pitches with the same movement every single time, um, even though, you know, so so we're not trying to fool the umpire, but you want it to have the same movement every yeah. time, right? Yeah, I mean, I, see, the way I look at it is not so much that you're trying to fool the umpire, but more so that you're just like, the umpire's job is to call balls and strikes, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, by making him call the ball or strike, it doesn't necessarily like make him like it, I'm just asking him to do his job. Right. So I don't see that as a, as a real negative. If you just go boom and he says, no, that's a ball. It's too low. Right. So I, I think that's just simply asking the umpire to do their job and asking the catcher to do their job. Um, you know, I don't think it's, I, I think we put a lot of stock into umpires, you know, negatively reacting to how the catcher moves the ball and then not getting calls in the future. But in reality, like the catcher moving that ball down and not getting that call doesn't get him the call either. So I want to make sure that guys just move the ball consistently. It always comes back towards their frame and the umpire does their job and they, they, they make the calls. And if they feel like it's a ball, it's a ball. If they feel like it's a strike, it's a strike. Um, you know, I don't want them to go like ball that's, you know, 5% strike, boom, hold, come on, give me that pitch, right? I just want, like, like what I always talk with our guys about is, like, hold it for the same amount every pitch, right? If you think it's a strike, you hold it for the same amount as you, the pitch that you think is a ball. It's just like a boom, present, throw it back. That's it. Um, there's never, like, beg for the call because ultimately that's what pisses the umpires off more than anything else. If you just go catch, boom, throw it back, and what you'll even see with some of our guys is they'll move it they'll actually, the pause will just be non-existent when they catch it really well and they throw it back. And sometimes they get those calls as well. Um, you see with Tyler Flowers all the time, he just flows straight through balls and throws them back to the pitcher. And the umpire calls balls that are, you know, really low percentage strikes, strikes because he didn't really get a good look at it. And it, his glove wasn't working away from the zone at any point. So, you know, as, as long as they're working it back and not really holding it and showing him up, I, I think it's all good. Um, you know, I just, I want our guys to be thinking no matter what the ball comes back to roughly my transfer location to throw it back to the pitcher. I, I think one of the things that, you know, we talk with our guys a lot about that kills receiving for catchers is they catch the ball. It's working this way and they pass it outside their knee and they throw it back like this mm -hmm. rather than bringing that ball back to them and throwing it back. Because what you start to see is they all of a sudden they start giving up on pitches that are actually pretty close to the strike zone or even like they're set up into a righty and the guy misses out over the plate, um, maybe yanks a fastball or cuts a fastball. It's supposed to go in and they catch it this way and they throw it back and it's actually in the strike zone and they lose that strike because they're not thinking about working it back to them. So I tell our guys like that outside pass is what I call it. That should never happen. I always want to see the ball come back here every time and go back to the pitcher. And I think that it really helps not so much the like getting the low percentage strike, but it really helps you from not losing the high percentage strike. That's a mislocation. Mm. Um, Cause I think that's one of the things that kills catchers at the major league level, as much as, you know, bad actions on close pitches, it's bad actions on strikes where they're, where they just think they're going to be somewhere else. So it's, you know, Hey, I set up for backdoor cutter with John Lester and he yanks to the other side of the plate and I turn my glove over and catch it like this rather than, you know, kind of staying behind it and working it back to my chest and throwing it back to the pitcher. That's where I get that strike. And it doesn't look, it doesn't look as good as I want it to, but it gives the umpire a good enough look to make sure, oh, that actually is a strike, even though he missed his spot. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really good insight. Like I said, I, I, I just think the context along with that is really important because, you know, a lot of times you, you see guys, you, you know, you watch them on TV, but you don't necessarily understand or know the thought process behind it. Um, so I, I think those are all really important things. Um, I, I do kind of want to move on. You, you'd spoken earlier about the third best yep. thing. You the third thing you talked about uh, was the, you know, the beat the ball to the spot, have the timing. Um, I, I feel like that's an area that's confusing to a lot of people. 
Um, you, you know, mm-hmm. should I beat the ball to the spot? Should I meet the ball to the spot? And, and part of me thinks that it's more of a uh, it's more of a translation error. Sometimes people mean the same thing, but they use different terminology and and they get confused that way. So, so one guy may say yeah. meet the ball, one guy may say beat the ball, and, and they're they're trying to accomplish the same thing, but they're just using different words, which makes it confusing. Um, but mm-hmm. at the end of the day, it's it, it's a lot about pocket awareness and it's a lot about being able to pocket the ball. Is you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. So if it, I guess what I'm trying to ask is if we're trying to improve our timing, let's say a catcher hears somebody, a coach tells a catcher, Hey, you need your timings off. You know, you're, you're off. How, what does the catcher try to do to improve his timing? Do you have pocket drills you like, or how do you create awareness yeah. there? What, what would you do for a guy that maybe has poor timing? Yeah. Um, I, I think the, the thing that's important to just recognize before we go into this is like, So the reason I say beat the ball to the spot is not typically good when you're trying to work under the baseball is if the ball is coming in this way and your gloves working up this way, if I'm there before it, then I'm working up and the ball's working below me. It's going, I'm going past it, right? If I'm working up through it, then that's when I'm timing the pitch to go through it rather than getting there, getting to the location before the ball. If I'm there before the ball, the ball's below me. And that's not what we want. We want the ball to be above us. Um, so that, that's why I think about it in that way. Um, and because what happens is guys tend to, they're working up, the ball gets below them, and then they have to stab. And that's where they end up on top of the ball. And that's the action that takes place. And that's kind of why I think about it the way that I do, um, just to give a little context. But um, in terms of drills, there, there are two that I would go to. In terms of like pocket drills that I really like, um, I, I think – Training gloves are a great way to access the pocket that you want. Um, and, and I think about it more as like a proprioceptive thing. So we'll use, we use a, like a, a small training glove. Uh, we use the all-star donut. Um, and then we'll use wrist weights. And we've used the all-star, the anchor as well um, in the past. Um, and we, we, may, we always are toying around with different ones. but um, what I like about that is that you're, you have all these different pockets, right? So you, what you're teaching the catcher how to do is find the pocket and whatever's on their hand, right? Mm-hmm. So what we'll do is we actually, we occasionally we'll do a drill where we'll have all of the gloves as options and the guys that aren't up get to pick the glove that he uses on every catch. So we change the glove on every one, just like a, just like a hitter would, you know, use different weighted bats in a weighted bat training program. We do the exact same, or like a short bat, long bat, you know, same kind of thing. So we'll have a 31 inch glove, their regular 33 and a half inch glove, a 35, the donut, the weighted glove, the wrist weight, and they can have any of those things get thrown in. And it's a matter of how do I get on time and find the pocket with whatever I have in my hand and the ball coming at me. So by continuously changing that up, it makes it a lot easier for them when they go to their glove because they're just more aware with their pocket. Um, so I really like that one. I think it's a great way to do it. I know Brandon Oliver, who you had on this um, I, last week or earlier this week, I can't remember. Um, he's been experimenting with some things of that nature um, with different gloves. And, you know, I, I think that just just kind of random potpourri of gloves is a really good way to, to get guys to figure it out. Um, the other thing that you can do if you, if you don't feel as comfortable with that is just use, you know, go through their training stuff prior to like the, you know, the end of their training session with a different glove every day. So it's like, all right, today you get the mini glove today, you get your glove tomorrow, you get the donut glove, you know, there's like, here's the training glove of the day. So as you continue to change those gloves out, then guys keep finding the pocket in different places. Um, the other thing that I, I love, and this is not anything new by any means, is just like a, a ladder receiving drill where you work forwards towards the machine, and then you also work backwards away from the machine. Um, and you can kind of vary that however you'd like. So typically with our guys, like we'll start behind home plate, like further back than we would normally be. And then we'll work up towards home plate, past home plate, and then we'll have them work back in the same set. So they'll probably catch maybe 12 balls at once, or not at once, but, you know, 12 balls in one round. 12 balls at once. Go, the, the Cubs guys <laughs> catch 12 balls at once. That's what you got to do. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So so it's just like catch, 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 and then back up, catch, 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 catch. And that really challenges their timing 
Um, and I'm also lowering the machine as we go. So the pitch is roughly the same height every time. It's not, um, you can do it where as they get closer, the ball gets higher. But I think that tends to create glove moves, you know, in their pre-pitch move that we don't really want because they're trying to protect the ball from hitting them in the face, right? I think we've all done that drill where you just go, go until you can't go anymore and finally the ball hits you in the mask and you're out of there and the next guy goes, right? And that's, that's not what we really want to achieve there. We want to make sure that the ball's staying down. They're working up towards it. They're staying under it. And what you see with a lot of guys, they're actually better when they're working towards it because the timing window gets smaller and they don't have as much time to do this, right? If they do that, they get beat by the ball. But what, where you see guys grow is actually when they're going back. If they, can, if they can slow the ball down and still go down, up, through, then that's when they're really starting to get somewhere. Um, the other way that you can do that too is in a similar way to what we do with the gloves. You can have the guys that are waiting to go pick what area they go to. So you could like draw lines in the dirt or you could spray paint or use like the, the soccer ref stuff that like, mm -hmm. goes away um, if you have turf. Um, but pick these different areas and say like, all right, you're in zone one, you're in zone four, you're in zone six, you're back in zone two, you're in zone five. So they're challenging the timing every time and making them go to different locations um, as they go through that. That's a really good way to use that as well. But just thinking a little bit more outside of the box than just, all right, I start in the back and I move forward until I can't catch it anymore. Um, using that drill in that way is really good, I think. I like that, man. And so I love the training mitt stuff. I'm not a big gimmick guy, but training mitts I absolutely love. The analogy I always use is I say um, it's like a golf club. You know, I think a lot of them, you can't go play golf with one club. You, you can't just have a driver and even a putter. You got to have different irons. You got to have sand wedges. You got to have, I have, I have to have plenty of sand wedges, uh, but you have to have different things. And I think training mitts are very similar where, you know, the donut, for example, that's a great mitt, but you can only use it for so many drills. You know, I think the anvil or the weighted one, that's a great mitt too, the pocket or, or whatever. So I like the idea of mixing them up, but I, I've never really mixed them up in between sets like you're talking about or it, it, inside one yeah. exercise where, hey, this one's the, the mm -hmm. donut, this one's the small pocket, this one's the regular mitt. Um, so I'm definitely going to implement that. Uh, but before we kind of yeah. move forward, I want, I want to step back and talk about one thing. When you were talking about, you know, beating the ball to the spot, uh, what pops in my mind immediately, is, and maybe this is showing my age, but I think of the movie Back to the Future. You know, when when they had to get the energy for the DeLorean, the DeLorean had to be going 88 miles an hour at the exact instant that the lightning hit the uh, hit the clock tower. You know, so the DeLorean can't be sitting there waiting for the lightning to strike. The lightning has to hit yep. as the DeLorean had to go at the same time. So I feel like that's an, it, for me, that's an easy way to think about it. You know, how can we meet the ball? Yeah. Oh, excuse me, how can we meet the ball at the same time and not be sitting there waiting for it prematurely? Uh, so yep. maybe, maybe that's, maybe that's a, a perfect. I'm going to use that. I like it. I like it. We're going to steal that. So it's the DeLorean, man. I like DeLoreans. There's, there's going to be so many 12 year old kids that, clinics and stuff like that they're like what's back to the future back to the future what's a delorean <laughs> it was marty mcfly yeah so <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I had no idea where this podcast was going, but like, you never know when a Back to the Future reference or hoverboard reference is going to pop up. So there you go. Uh, good stuff. But man, that's interesting. Um, I I'm just curious. I am curious about a few other implements you used. Y you know, you, you mentioned wrist weights, and you also I've seen you use plyo balls before. I know those are big for you. Um, I guess the reason I'm curious to ask is there's a lot of, you know, catchers out there. You can buy those things that are fairly inexpensively. You know, you don't have to go spend a ton of money. Even some of the, even some of the training mitts are more expensive, but a set of plyo balls mm -hmm. is fairly expensive. Most people can find access to those uh, wrist weights. Yeah. It may not be at every facility, but a lot of people can find them. So those two tools specifically, how do you use those? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, to be honest, I use two plyo balls. I have, there are two different weights that I use, two different sizes, and that's it. And so you could get those, I mean, I think you could, those would come in for less than, gosh, I think they're maybe $10 for both of them. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not, we're talking like minimal amounts of money. Um, I use a big plyo ball that's, um, it's more like a, like a physical therapy ball that's two pounds. Mm -hmm. um, and then I use a weighted baseball that is 21 ounces that's um but it's kind of like that medicine ball like that squishy medicine ball style one just because i can't it's the heaviest weighted ball i can find that's baseball size um so i use the big one um almost exclusively for barehanded movements um and the reason i do that is because i want to think about using the weighted ball more for 
path and force production than I do for like finding the pocket. Like I, I personally don't find a ton of value with our guys doing, you know, this kind of work mm -hmm. where they're working with three fingers or two fingers or, you know, things of that nature. Um, for the most part, like they know where the pocket there, they have a vague idea or we get to the pocket in other ways rather than with bare hand and stuff. So I use the weighted ball, like typically I have really started doing this this year. I haven't done it in the past, but I stand up and I feed it to them from maybe six to 10 feet away. So I get a real downward path of the ball. So it's, it feels really heavy because two pounds is a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and it forces them to work up through the ball and it really gives them some feedback on where the ball hits them. So I think everyone that I've worked with, except for Wilson Contreras, he loves that with his that ball with his regular glove um and it actually works really well for him it was some that um you know one of the things that i always tell our guys is like this what i do for for wilson doesn't have to be what i do with vic it doesn't have to be what i did with jt or with nappy or with alfaro like any of those guys like they're all different guys so this stuff is you know it's all things that we're going to put in and then we're going to figure out how it works best for you so Wilson really likes doing that with his glove on because he feels like the ball hits him further away from his hand. So he feels like his force production has to be even better when his gloves on his hand and the ball's hitting in the pocket rather than hitting him in the palm, um, which, which makes sense for me and it, it works for him. So we, we do that. Um, but once again, like I'm really thinking about how they attack the ball, what path that their glove is on and how they work through it and how much force they have to put into it to make the ball become a one part move rather than a, you know, two part move, if that makes sense. Um, what the smaller one is one that we transition to. Um, so they have their glove on and I, I typically like to do this with the small training glove um, because it's just a little bit more challenging. Um, but on occasion we'll do it with their regular glove because once again, it does kind of push the ball out away from their hand a little bit more and make them use the force a little bit better. Um, so, that one's a little bit more pocket awareness, but it's the same concept. It's how do I get on the plane and create enough force to work through the ball um, as I use that one. Um, and then the wrist weight, I use in a, a variety of ways. I haven't used it a ton this year, to be honest. Um, I use it a lot in the past, um, but it's just something to keep, that's heavy and it kind of keeps the glove down and it kind of mimics the weight of a ball that really moves south on a guy. So like, when you catch Luis Garcia, who's now with the Texas Rangers, and he's throwing 98 mile an hour sinkers that go down 12 inches, like mm -hmm. the ball feels really heavy. It feels like you're catching a bowling ball, and it's not a lot of fun, right? <laughs> but if we can prepare them for that, so it's not the first time they catch Luis Garcia, that's the heaviest ball they've felt that day. Um, you know, I think that creates a lot of value. So you know, I, I think that's a really good way to think about it. Is like, hey, when I catch the starter. Am I catching the fastest pitch I've caught all day, or am I, or is this like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm already in this window. I already caught off the machine. I'm ready for that speed. You know, I, I, that ball comes in from Jake Arrieta and it's sinking down and it's heavy. You know, is that the heaviest ball I've felt today, or I've already felt something that heavy? And when the guys can answer with, hey, I've already felt that as I go into the bullpen to get ready for the game, then they start to be a lot more prepared for what they're going to see in the game and they can get, they can feel the starter out really quickly and then they can take it into the game really well. So I really like that just thinking about, Hey, how do I make this harder than the game? And then be able to go into the bullpen and have that feel really easy and then be ready for the game when it shows up. Um, so that's the, the weighted balls are to create weight and to work on path. Um, the wrist weight really helps them keep the glove down, but it also cr creates weight um, that they have to work up through the ball with. And then the other thing too, is I think the wrist weight just moves their pocket in different places. So, you know, when you're talking about pocket awareness and ways to have guys find the pocket, if you want to throw the wrist weight on and off, that really messes with their ability to find the pocket in a lot of guys, especially the guys that struggle with that. Um, so it's a great way to, to, to work towards, you know, more pocket awareness by throwing the wrist weight on and off with all those different gloves and things of that nature. Um, I just use a two and a half pound wrist weight. It's pretty light. Um, we have a five pound one that I've never transitioned to, but I'm sure you could do that if you wanted to. So, um, but yeah, I think once again, those are pretty cheap as well. Yeah. Interesting thoughts there. And something that, you know, as you're speaking about that, something that crossed my mind and I'd say it's a little bit off topic, but I think it's interesting when you 
Would you say being a bullpen catcher and actually having to catch guys in the bullpen, how much did that influence your thoughts or maybe what you teach with you actually being able to to feel what it feels like when a guy's throwing 98 and guys are throwing disgusting sliders? Um, did that have any influence on your teaching method or maybe just the way you conceptualize or understand this stuff? Yeah, I think absolutely. I mean, for one, it gave me like a really – good idea of what they were actually going through in the game when they're catching these guys because I, I, I think it's it's really easy to say like hey you can or can't do this and I watch this in the game and this is how you apply it but it's a totally different animal when you actually feel it and it was great to be able to feel what our guys are like because once you go like then I think the, it created some credibility with our guys because we, we could talk we could have conversations about what it's like to catch you know, Luis Garcia or Hector Neris or, you know, Vince Velasquez. And we all know, and they know it a lot better than I do because they catch me in the game, which is a totally different animal. I totally understand that. But they know that I've been catching them. So I have a lot of the, I, you know, I have a pretty good idea of what some of the struggles are with those guys and why it's hard to receive that pitch with that guy because he all, he's missing his spot or it's sinking more than you think or the, you know, the splits disappearing that day. Um, I think that helped a lot, but I, th I think the other thing that probably helped me more than anything else is that Bob Stumpo and I, our other bullpen catcher, we tr just tried out a ton of stuff. We would, we would go into the cage after like days in spring training, especially the first year. And we would catch for an hour and a half and just try out moves, try out different drills, try out different gloves, try out different speeds of balls, different shapes of pitches, and just see what it felt like. Um, and I think that was really valuable for, for us to just experiment a lot. And that's something that I definitely recommend for anybody that's able to be able to still catch um, is to just, just get back there and see what you're asking your guys to do, see how it feels, see how achievable, see how attainable that is. I think that helps a ton. And it's, um, it's something that's definitely helped me in my career. Um, and I think, God, I was going to say one other thing, but I lost my train of thought. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, as far as that goes, like, I mean, I think that's part of the reason that Cap hired me in that job and the way that he did, because he felt like, hey, even though you haven't caught in the in professional baseball at this level, you know, we're going to ask you to catch these guys. So you'll start to get you'll start to get some of the in the field experience that you would get if you were an ex player. And that was some that, you know, I think um, was on his mind as he was going through this is like, all right, this guy doesn't have any experience, but this is a great way that he can get the the playing experience without actually having played. Um, and like I said, I mean, there's, there's no comparison between catching in the bullpen and catching on the field in a major league game. I'm not trying to say that that's what I am or anything like that. Um, but it was definitely tremendously helpful for me. And, you know, I think it, I think it helped, you know, a lot with our guys, you know, I could, because the thing I was worried about at first is that they were going to watch me catch and be like, you can't even do this stuff. How are you going to ask me to do it? And, um, but I, you know, we kind of, we tried to nip that in the bud as quickly as possible and say like, Hey man, if, if your goal is to be better than me, you're not going to have a very good career because I didn't have one. So, uh, you know, if that, that can't be the, the barometer for success. You have to strive for something better than that. Um, and I think the other thing that was kind of cool too, is like, we'd have days where we'd, you know, stump and I would strap the gear on and we'd get back there and we'd, we'd do the drills with the guys, you know, we'd do, we'd have blocking competitions. We'd work on receiving with the guys. We'd have them feed the machine sometimes and just have them, like we could be a part of it a little bit more. And it made it more of a collaborative process um, than it was, than it would be if I just coached the guys every time. So I think that, I think that was enjoyable for them too. It made it feel a little bit more digestible if that makes sense. I think it's awesome. And you know, I love just how much you experiment and how much you try new new things and you're getting back there and you're actually mm -hmm. doing it. Um, but I think there's kind of a valuable lesson in there for, for a lot of people uh, who maybe have just kind of seen you from afar or maybe seen other people in your position from afar. They think, oh, this guy is a, a college guy or he's in the private sector and he gets this job in pro ball. There's a lot going on behind the scenes that people don't necessarily see you know, of you putting in the work, of you strapping on the gear, of you trying different things and getting it. And I, I can, I can attest how hard that is. Last, last year with Team USA, when I had to catch these college guys, I mean, who many of them are going in the top round or two in the coming draft. Uh, it, it's a challenge. I mean, we got dudes throwing close to hundred miles an hour with, with dirty breaking pitches. Um, it it kind of, 
it, it makes you really put it in perspective and, and it makes you force yourself to feel some different things that you, you don't feel when you're just watching video. Even if you watch a lot of video, you know, there's, there's no yeah. uh, replacement for getting in there and actually feeling it. Yeah. And I think the other thing that you realize too, is how much, you know, for me, it was 10 years of not catching impacts your ability to catch. And I think I'm sure you felt the same thing, but oh, it's yeah. like when you take some time away from that position, it's really hard to get back there again. So it makes you, you get, it creates, for me, it creates a lot of respect for converted guys because you start to get a feel for like, whoa, this is, this is what this might be like for this guy. He's never played this position before. And we're asking him to jump back there and throw the gear on and catch professional pitchers. Like it's, it's that's a, that's been for me a good perspective as well. And I'm thinking about that because it's, it is a, it was a long time for me from playing in college to when I was catching these guys that were in the big leagues, and it was quite an adjustment, I will tell you that. And I'm, I'm sure the Phillies pitchers are happy to have me out of there. <laughs> well, I know what I had to do it last year when I found out I was catching bullpens. The very first thing I did was I got online and I started researching what is the strongest cup available? What is what is the strongest cup <laughs> that I can wear that's going to keep me protected back yeah. there? Because because it's new, and like I said, those especially when we talk about guys that are at that level. Uh, it, it's, it's and fortunately you have the catch some already so you're good there that's right Ar already had one of those so it's good to go uh man that's interesting yeah. so guy yeah, we've been on here an hour about an hour we've only talked about receiving we haven't hit blocking or throwing or, or game calling or management or anything else um so but I, I don't really want to dive into a completely different topic but man craig i definitely appreciate you taking time uh, i know how busy you guys are and, and hopefully you guys get cranked up soon uh, and games will get started and we'll at least have some sort of a season this year. But but definitely just want to say thanks for coming on. Um, I'll link all your info below so people can find you online if they if they want to. Uh, but, man, like I said, I enjoyed the conversation. I always learn something every time I talk to you. Uh, so I appreciate you being here and look forward to talking to you again soon. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Dan. This is a blast. And, uh, you know, if you want to go back and talk some other topics another time, then we, maybe we can dive into blocking, throwing, game calling, and all those other things that go into catching besides receiving. That would be a blast. Yeah, man. Well, uh, depending on how long uh, it, it takes for baseball season to start, there may, may be a couple of seasons of catching one on one TV. Yeah. So I may get you on here. Who knows? Again, I might have time. <laughs> you know, I hope not, but let's see. So, yeah, thanks again, yeah, man. Me, so do I. I appreciate Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Great, great being on.